Good, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you this Monday morning. My name is J.B. Holston. I'm the CEO of the Greater Washington Partnership. And on behalf of the Partnership and the Greater Washington Board of Trade, thank you very much for joining the 2021 Capital Region Transportation Forum. This is the fourth forum that uh, we've had the opportunity to work on with the Greater Washington Board of Trade. And we're delighted to have that opportunity. And I'll turn it to uh, my friend Jack McDougall for a couple of words uh, in just a moment. It's an incredibly exciting time to be talking about transportation and infrastructure. It's uh, finally infrastructure year. Uh, we had uh, the partnership had the opportunity to talk to Leader Hoyer last week about some of the provisions of the um, infrastructure law that has passed. And he was commenting three things that I thought I'd observe uh, before I hand it off to Jack. First, this is literally tens of billions of dollars of opportunity for our region. Uh, and that is uh, by magnitude, well beyond anything that we've had uh, as an opportunity for funding for transportation and infrastructure for this region uh, historically. Um, secondly, much of the money will be competitive. So there is a need and opportunity for the region to act together as much as possible to take advantage of uh, some of this uh, incremental funding. Uh, third, um, two watchwords for the law, and I know for this administration, one is uh, inclusion. Uh, think about investments that drive a more inclusive uh, economy. And second, um, think about long term versus short term. So with those as some parameters, we're absolutely delighted to have um, the experts that we've got here today, the three states, the two states and uh, the districts, Department of Transportation leads. They've collectively been working for years on exactly these issues and to ensure that the region is ready to take advantage of, uh, of this incremental uh, funding and, uh, and uh, um, win more than our fair share since we're all among friends here. Uh, so it's a timely conversation. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, Jack, thanks very much for the partnership and happy holidays to you. Oh, great. Thanks, JB. And uh, welcome everyone this morning. Uh, JB, we value our cl close collaboration with you and in your team as well around this important discussion, but even more broadly around our, we our uh, work regionally on mobility and infrastructure. So again, thank you for that. Uh, before we kick things off today, I also want to thank our federal delegation for their efforts in getting the infrastructure bill passed. You know, as we well know, physical and digital infrastructure are critical to our economy and our quality of life. And this bill finally begins to address serious and long neglected needs both across our region as well as the country. So with that, I do wanna thank Congresswoman uh, Norton, Senator Van Hollen, Senator Warner, Senator Kane, and Congressman Brown uh, for working on the bill, um, but also for sharing with us why it was so important. They, uh, they all took time out of their busy schedules to create a video uh, in preparation for this event this morning, and you can find it on our Twitter pages. So I I'd ask you to check it out. It just shows, again, I think to JB's point, just how we are all really working very closely together uh, to get things moving across our region. You know, and on that too, I also wanna thank Mayor Bowser, Governor Northam and Governor Hogan for their leadership through the pandemic, but plus their leadership in building the region's 21st century infrastructure networks uh, and for granting us the opportunity today to hear from their transportation leaders. Uh, as JB said, really pleased to continue this tradition. This is the fourth capital region transportation forum that we've hosted, and we've actually done some pretty cool things uh, at this event over the years, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, but it's really important to keep bringing the public and private sectors together to discuss these critical uh, issues for our region. And I also want to really thank our sponsors for making this event possible. Our presenting sponsor, Northeast Maglev, uh, we'll hear from Ian Rainey in, in a few minutes, and our supporting sponsors, AECOM, Aon, and HNTB, our community sponsors, Transurban and WSP. And so with that, again, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. And I wanna hand it off to Ian Rainey from Northeast Maglev to get things started. So thank you. Thanks, Ian. Great, thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, JB uh, and Jack for that kind introduction. It's great to be here. Um, and thanks to the Greater Washington Board of Trade and the Greater Washington Partnership for hosting the Capital Region Transportation Forum. Uh, I'm Ian Rainey and I represent the Northeast Maglev Projects. Uh, we're a team that's working to bring superconducting maglev to the Northeast Corridor. Uh, superconducting maglev, for those who aren't familiar with it, or SC maglev for short, is an ultra high speed train that travels at over 300 miles per hour. The system is actually operating today in Japan and it'll soon connect Tokyo and Nagoya, which is the world's busiest transportation corridor. We think it'll be transformational for our region too. 
At 300 miles per hour, SC Maglev will get you from DC to Baltimore in just 15 minutes and from DC to New York in under one hour. The project will take over 20 million cars off the road each year between DC and Baltimore alone. That prevents an untold number of accidents and it eliminates millions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions. It also create hundreds of thousands of construction and long-term jobs. To that end, we've partnered with labor groups and we've committed to an ambitious set of goals to ensure that the SC Magla project maximizes job opportunities for women and people of color. More than any time in the past decade, we need this kind of stimulus for our economy delivered in a fashion that prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion. To be sure, uh, our project absolutely supports a holistic approach to enhancing all mobility options in the Northeast Corridor. That includes better roads, reliable air travel, and ensuring that our existing rail infrastructure is in a state of good repair. And we strongly applaud the historic investment investments that are being made in Amtrak now. But we also need to look at the longer term growth and demand in the corridor. And we need to think about our global competitiveness if we intend to ensure that the Northeast Corridor retains its economic preeminence well into the future. We need to do more than just improve our existing systems. We need to invest in technology that can dramatically reduce travel times and thus eliminate one of the major barriers to sustained economic growth on the corridor. And so we're working now with the federal government, the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia and a number of other stakeholders to make the SC Maglev project a reality. In January of this year, the draft environmental impact statement, draft EIS was released for public comment. Once all of those comments are evaluated and the EIS is complete, we can segue into construction. This project simply wouldn't be possible without the support and cooperation of our government colleagues at the federal level, and equally importantly at the state and district levels. And so I'm especially honored to introduce this morning's panel. Everett Lott is the interim director of the District Department of Transportation, where he brings more than 25 years of experience in administration, human resources, budgeting, finance, grants, labor and employee relations and facilities management. Shannon Valentine is the Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Appointed by Governor Northam in January 2018, Secretary Valentine oversees 10,000 employees across seven agencies who support Virginia's multimodal transportation system. And Secretary Slater is the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Secretary Slater was nominated in 2019 after two decades of public service in the Maryland State Highway Administration. Secretary Slater leads a department of more than 10,000 transportation professionals. These three leaders are overseeing some of the most dynamic projects and tackling some of the most complex transportation issues in the country during what is an historically challenging time. I hope we can get their insights about the future trans of transportation in our region, especially in light of new infrastructure legislation that's recently been enacted. I personally have the privilege of working with the district and Maryland Departments of Transportation, both of which are involved in the SC Maglev project. And it's a true pleasure to work with such dedicated and professional staff. I commend our panelists and appreciate their leadership of their respective departments. I'd now like to turn it over to the moderator of the panel, Robert McCartney. Robert is a former distinguished Washington Post editor and columnist, and he's the current host of the Think Regionally podcast for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Thank you again to the Board of Trade and the Greater Washington Partnership. The Northeast Maglev has been a member of the board for a decade. We're extremely proud of this relationship and we're honored to sponsor this event. Robert, over to you. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, JB and Jack from the Greater Washington Partnership and Board of Trade for, for sponsoring this event. This is, as we've already heard, a pivotal moment for transportation in this country and in this region. Um, the pandemic hopefully is going away, uh, but it has up, upended the way we travel. We don't know all of the implications, long-term implications <clears throat> of how the pandemic and the associated recession are going to affect transportation. And obviously the historic uh, billions, multi-billions of dollars coming to us 
uh, from the bipartisan infrastructure deal is going to allow the region to make historic investments in our transportation infrastructure. So today we'll be hearing from th you know th the three top decision makers who oversee the transportation systems in our region. And I really am happy and proud to welcome um, the leaders of the Capital Region's Departments of Transportation, Secretary Shannon Valentine, uh, Director Everett Lott from the District of Columbia, and Maryland Secretary Gregory Slater. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so let's go right to it. Uh, we'll start by looking at this, at this period vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic. Uh, we're nearly two years into the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so from your perspective as leaders of the transportation agencies and your experience in the industry, uh, briefly, you know, each of you, have we reached a new normal uh, or are we still in crisis mode and how much longer is that going to last? Uh, let's start with Secretary Valentine. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the question. I just really want to thank um, Jack McDougall and JB and Ian for the um, warm welcome for all of us and making this all possible. Um, and to my colleagues, Everett Lott and Greg Slater over in Maryland. So always happy to be with you. It is a little disappointing that we can't be in person, I will just say. But um, obviously, these we're continuing to make decisions um, based on the pandemic that we have all lived through together. Um, and, you know, as, as we look back, and I'm going to leave the door open that at some point in our future, we can actually be in person to think about this. Um, there is just so many lessons to be learned um, from these nearly two years. And I would say none maybe more important than the fact that transportation is fundamental to people's lives each and every day. It is the platform for economic recovery and growth and what each of us and all those who are listening today and participating, you know, just how important your work is. From the beginning, I would say, you know, our focus was on health and safety, um, connecting, workers and people to essential work, food, medicine, um, and transporting critical cargo. That commitment has never changed over this nearly two year period. I would say that as we are working through the pandemic, um, we have also been really focused on the financial implications of COVID the, uh, the impact of shutting down a global economy and what that means, and monitoring and evaluating trends on an ongoing real-time basis. Um, workforce options, traffic patterns, travel options, um, return to work policies. All of this has become integral to our work. So I would say, I am not ready to declare the new normal because I still believe we're trying to figure out what that is. I really see this as a time of great opportunity. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, to make really smart investments um, and to collaborate to make this region um, a, a true model for the country and the world. Thank you. Uh Secretary Slater, uh, are we back to normal or, uh, and if not, how much further do we have to go? I do, I mean, I think we're, we're getting there. I think the question is, and, and kind of relating back to what Secretary Valentine said, what is that new normal? You know, so, you know, from a health perspective, while there are still gonna be variants out there, uh, we just have to remain vigilant. So we're partially in a new normal, but partially still in that cautious crisis mode. And so, you know, you look, look at the data and kind of what that says. So our afternoon peak trips on the vehicular side are back to pre-pandemic levels. You know, our traffic volumes are only 3% below where they were in 2019. And our truck traffic volumes are 20% over where they were in 2019. So we're starting to see a lot of that return. You know, it, when our Baltimore system, for instance, our core bus system is only down 25%, but our Metro and light rail are down uh, much lower. Uh, but then you look at the commuter side between Baltimore and DC, our MARC train system is down 72% still and our commuter bus is down uh, 76. But uh, 
We have passengers returning back to BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport. We're only down 24%. We're recovering really well there. Uh, and the Port of Baltimore is seeing more cargo than we ever have. So, you know, we have, uh, we've kind of settled on a little bit of a, a normal pattern, but I don't know if we're ready to call it the new normal yet. But we really need to remain really adaptable to these new challenges, but the old habits are starting to kind of set in on some of the, the commuter side. But in my mind, uh, Bob, one of our greatest challenges pre-pandemic was how short our planning horizon was uh, with the rapid pace of technology and things like automated and connected vehicles. Um, but the pandemic itself was the great disruptor, kind of changing things even further. So it, it's both a challenging and fun time to be in this transportation world, but uh, the new normal today isn't necessarily the new normal tomorrow. So we have to continue to focus uh, on what that looks like. I'm glad to hear the Port of Baltimore is uh, is so busy that maybe the supply disruptions for Christmas won't be so bad. <laughs> um, Director Lott, um, the, you know, one of the biggest effects of the pandemic, of course, was prompting a lot of people to go to telework. Uh, so for the district, that means fewer people going downtown. Um, you know, how does that, how, how much, how is it, how much is it back to normal in terms of people uh, commuting to downtown? And, and what do you, what do you think the, the future looks like there? Well, Bob, again, I want to thank you and the Washington Board of Trade for having me here this morning to my colleagues. I want to thank them as well. And so, you know, we don't really know what the, the new normal will look like or how long it's going to take us to get there. So um, we've had to be very adaptive and very responsive because we've seen some of those trends really impacting our um, our, our local downtown area. Um, this pandemic has forever changed our communities, um, the way we work, our work environment, um, and the way we even operate in the city. And so over the past couple of years, past you know, couple of years now, we've, we've shown that we can rise up to address the COVID. So um, in order to prevent the crowding, um, we've very expeditiously worked on our bus lane infrastructure. Um, we really took a more aggressive approach to prevent crowding in our bus stops. Uh, for example, the 14th Street Bus Priority Project. So we have a lot of dedicated bus lanes now in Washington, D.C., um, with the expectation that we will get back to normal and that people will be coming back into the city and back into downtown. And we want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to be able to move them very quickly and very safely and very cost efficiently. Um, we've also reprioritized the build out of our, our cycling infrastructure, our bike lanes. Uh, for example, the Crosstown cycle track. Um, that encourages physically distant uh, modes such as biking. Um, and along with the challenge of this pandemic, um, we also, the district, we stood in the crosshairs of a very national public reckoning with social justice matters. Um, and as this occurred, um, we were able to use our public right of way to make a statement um, about DC's values via the uh, creation of Black Lives Matter Plaza. So, you know, we've been very active. We've been anticipating that we will get back to the normal or the normal that we um, uh, enjoyed before the pandemic. Um, and at that point in time, we wanna make sure that we have the infrastructure in place with our dedicated bus lanes um, and our bike infrastructure. So those folks who choose to travel by bike or by scooting um, or by bus, they have those options and it'll be a very reliable and affordable way to do that. Great, thanks so much. Okay, let's now go address some specific questions to each jurisdiction about stuff going on uh, in their area. Secretary Valentine, uh, it's no secret, of course, that your term as secretary is coming to an end. Um, the, what do you think the, the biggest one or two challenges are going to be for whomever Glenn Youngkin picks as your successor in the new administration? A really good question. Um, I would say that um, I had mentioned to you that, you know, I declared early that I would be leaving this position um, in January. Um, for those of you with whom I've had the opportunity to work, I will just say I have loved this job. Um, we have been in, in transportation at a most exciting time. Um, and I just am very grateful for um, uh, the chance to work with so many of you. I would say in Virginia, there's really three things converging at one time. First is um, the Commonwealth, we in transportation have had a very successful partnership um, with the General Assembly, whether it was Republican leadership or Democratic leadership. Um, so many of you here listening today have been a part of um, some of these achievements, one being the historic 
um, investment in Metro, which is an agreement between DC, Maryland and um, the Commonwealth. We were able to secure that funding um, and put in place reforms. Um, we had the passage of the interstate funding, which really began as an I-81 bill, but bringing uh, real uh, investment and funding to um, the major freight routes in Virginia. So that was really important and kind of a miracle. Um, we had a sustainability study. We've made it uh, record investments at the Port of Virginia, expanding capacity by 40% fully automating our systems, moving more by rail than any port on the East Coast. Those investments and that capacity have met global demand right at the, the, the right time. Um, so that's been really important. And then the passage of the omnibus transportation package, which created a, a um, uh, restructured the, the um, funding, we tied it to CBI, CPI, we created a um, uh, highway use fee um, we are in the process of developing a mileage-based user fee. Um, we created new programs like the governance structure for passenger rail and a centralized Commonwealth Transportation Fund. And that really is a financial commitment to a multimodal system. That was not to be implemented fully until 2024. So we had four years to, to direct these programs, fully implement the omnibus funding. At year one, COVID hit, so we're only a few months into it. So in the Commonwealth over the next two years, there's a lot going on at the state level. The second thing that happened was the president signed the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, generational um, investments in infrastructure and how important and uh, 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 how much we need to be prepared for that funding, not just for the reauthorization and the additional funding coming into our programs. Um, it's the new programs that have been created and the discretionary grant opportunities, being prepared for that. And the third thing that Virginia is going through is we're the only state in the country going through an administrative administration change. Um, we're doing this through a transition time so for me, this particular time where we're um, passing the baton, um, kind of turning this over to a new administration, uh, just making sure that we do it in the best way possible. We want Virginia, regardless of how, what the future and how that unfolds, is in the best position to manage um, these incredible opportunities. And I really believe that the collaborative spirit within Virginia and the collaborative spirit within this region um, are going to be uh, really essential to making this all happen. So um, yes, I think Virginia is going through a lot. Thank you for, the, you know, I will say, Bob, that uh, podcasts, I think more podcasts are going to be in my future as well. Thank you for that plug for my Think Reasonably <laughs> podcast for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governors. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Secretary Slater, uh, Maryland is working on um, a couple of mega transportation projects, the Purple Line, uh, construction well underway, and then the I-270 Beltway American Legion Bridge Traffic Relief Plan, um, which is um, in an early, you know, in a planning and development stage. Maryland's pushing all this at a time when, you know, the future of transit ridership and highway traffic is, is much more in doubt uh, because of the rise we were talking about before with the uh, director Lott, the, the increase in use of remote work, telework, hybrid work. So what is MDOT thinking about making these big investments in transit and especially the high, widening the highways when there's so much uncertainty about what the future of transportation is going to look like? Really, really good question, Bob. You know, it's funny in the infrastructure bill, you know, there's a lot of resources in there for broadband as well. And, you know, in my mind, our transportation system of the future of broadband is as important as the rail line or the, or the asphalt or the concrete that we're seeing. But, you know, our system in the future, uh, in all modes of transportation, just to kind of illustrate our way of thinking, our system of the future has to be automated. It has to be connected. It has to be electric. It's shared. 
but it also has to be integrated and adaptable with the growth that a region uh, is projecting. So you know, we're already seeing vehicular traffic return. Our transit ridership is gonna take a little bit longer, but the national capital region is still growing and we have to prepare for that reality. When you look at where uh, Washcog was earlier this year in April, they still show the Washington region adding over 1 million residents and another million and a half jobs by 2045. So we need to think about that as we're building the infrastructure that's today. So we need to accommodate this growth and, and, and all of this can't be done overnight. So we need to plan, we need to build for that uh, in the present if we hope to kind of keep pace with that uh, in the future, whether it's the Purple Line or whether it's the American Legion Bridge or the Frederick Douglass Tunnel or our Howard Street Tunnel or any part of our system, we have to be thinking about how it fits into the mobility of the future, the accessibility of the future. And when you look at the look at the economic activity that's happening around the Silver Line in Virginia, the Purple Line is next. Uh, and when you think about how the hot lanes in Virginia have really moved more people, have been adaptable, uh, I think the same thing with the American Legion Bridge. And we'll be able to do it by also addressing a critical infrastructure need uh, with the American Legion Bridge and also include bike and pedestrian infrastructure that connects over to the CNO Canal. It's about these kind of integrated solutions. You know, the Douglas Tunnel is another great one where, you know, it will help us further bring that DC and Baltimore region together for job accessibility. We have the Howard Street Tunnel, which is the same thing on the freight side that's going to allow the Port of Baltimore to grow through rail. So it's really thinking about the future, but it's all about the system of tomorrow and how that system works together today in an integrated way uh, to manage that growth in the future and the opportunity that comes with that growth. Thank you. Uh, Director Lott, the, the district and DDOT especially uh, have been leaders in expanding pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure over the past few years we're working toward the vision zero goal of zero traffic fatalities. Uh, but as you know, we, we continue to hear these tragic stories of pedestrians and bikers hit by cars. Uh, there was an incident just, just in the last 48 hours, I think, a tragic incident. The mayor went to the site uh, where, where the person was struck. Um, so, you know, what, what needs to be done to accelerate progress towards vision zero? And I think you know, where the district is going can be a model for the for the suburbs as well. Yeah, Bob, thanks for that question. And it, it was unfortunate. We actually had two incidents this past weekend, um, both involving very young people. And so we are, um, you know, really taking a, a more aggressive approach at things that we can do to um, modify our infrastructure and, and make it more pedestrian friendly and, and make it safer for all. But what we know is that, you know, ex uh, equity, um, it expresses itself in uh, as maintaining safety for everyone using the right of way, uh, particularly those that are dependent upon our non-motorized modes of travel. <clears throat> and this has the, the added benefit of advancing sustainability goals, as well as by making people feel safer um, upon, you know, using other less polluting modes of transportation. So we've prioritized safety around our schools. We've also, also prioritized safety at our traffic circles, specifically like the 16th Street and Chevy Chase Circle, which sees a, a large, uh, folk, large group of people coming in from the Maryland area, traveling into DC, into our downtown quarters. Um, we reconfigured the intersection of Fourth Blair and Cedar. I mean, also enhanced mobility options on New Jersey Avenue Northwest by adding a protected bike lane and permitting two-way traffic. Um, but we also have enhanced traffic signal operations at 49 of our intersections, um, of which 32 were done specifically to improve pedestrian safety. Uh, and we also implemented 23 livability study and safety recommendations. And so um, through our um, Safe Routes to School programs, DDOT has assessed over 97 schools for short and medium term safety improvements, um, constructing speed bumps, right turn hardening. We did a, roughly about uh, constructed speed bumps at about 17 of our schools and posted speed uh, limit signs, our flashers at six of those schools. Um, we've also really been engaged in a, in a public service campaign or public service announcement where we're saying 20 is plenty, and this is not an invitation to speed. We're really imploring drivers to, to slow down, um, be cautious of your surroundings, and really do not you know, engage in distracted driving. Um, you've also seen some of these advertisements appear on our, our bus shelters, our billboards, radio and television ads, and social media. So we're doing everything that we can. We will continue to do um, things to really improve safety for all. 
but particularly for our most vulnerable users, which are pedestrians. Thanks. I know the red light and speeding cameras aren't popular, but they've got me to slow down. Um, <laughs> I've also That's contributed good. some revenue to the district budget. Uh, <laughs> not, not proud to say, but it's the truth. Okay, so now let's talk about what we really want to talk about, which is how we're going to spend all this money. Um, we're going to have, you know, historic influx of funds because of the federal uh, infrastructure package. So each of you, you know, what are you sort of most excited about in this bill? What are the projects that in particular you look forward to accelerating or perhaps putting new ones uh, on the on the on the board, uh, S Secretary Valentine. What what are you most excited about? You know, I am excited about the entire package. Secretary Slater went through just many of the investments in infrastructure, in um, broadband and electric charging. Uh, it's really looking at our entire system and building equity and sustainability throughout. So I'm excited about the entire um, investment. I will say that I'm often asked to speak about public and private um, uh, initiatives, public private investment. I always bring up the fact that the public piece is also very important. So having a reliable federal partner um, is really a game changer for all of us. Um, as far as specific projects, I will um, mention um, just a few, but in 2019, we did a comprehensive review of all of our surface transportation infrastructure, um, uh, about 130,000 miles of pavement of lane miles, 22,000 structures, 25 special structures, and really developed a new investment strategy over a longer term period, 20 years for pavement, 50 years for bridges. And it was a way for us to create a predictable long-term asset management system. The new bridge money within this um, infrastructure package we're getting about 536 million of new dollars coming into the system. We are able to accelerate that entire asset management program. It's bringing consistency and stability to asset management. It won't probably make a headline really, really foundational. Two, the rail investments um, we're so exciting to see with Amtrak and then the amount of money going to discretionary grants for inner city passenger rail. As so many of you know, we, we signed the definitive agreements for transforming rail in Virginia, a multilateral agreement between the Commonwealth, um, CSX Railroad, Amtrak and Virginia Rail Express. We, through that agreement, are uh, launching phases one and two. It's a $3.7 billion initiative, which includes the construction of Long Bridge across the Potomac. That is funded and it is moving forward. But we have already negotiated and planned for phases three and four, separating passenger and freight all the way down to Richmond. We, um, so with these discretionary grants, we can accelerate that entire program um, and really work on a true state and regional rail network. So very, very excited about that. I will also just say that the focus in this bill on collaboration, local, regional, state, federal um, collaboration, I think positions this region very uniquely. Uh, we have a track record of working collaboratively. And, you know, right now working with Secretary Slater um, on American Legion Bridge, our teams have been working together. Um, are there opportunities for us to really leverage this partnership for federal funding to move this project forward um, uh, even faster? And I will say that you know, the collaboration that we have with the District of Columbia and with, um, you know, they've been a great partner in from Long Bridge from the beginning, leading the environmental impact of that project. Um, and right now working um, on an MOA regarding the pedestrian bicycle bridge that's going to be adjacent to the, um, the new Long Bridge. 
so many opportunities. So I would say that this investment from the federal government is providing the reliability and the consistency that we need to really plan and deliver an integrated multimodal transportation system for this region. It's a game changer. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Slater, uh, same question. What are the, what does this allow you to do? What does this federal package allow you to do faster or th than you planned before? Or what does it allow you to do that you didn't even have dreams of doing? Absolutely. You know, it's, it, it gives you some stability. So, you know, one of my uh, hazards over the years is I've been around for a long time, you know, I was in the planning di director of planning and programming at State Highway in the recession. So having to rebuild after the recession, now being in the secretary's seat uh, through COVID and having to rebuild the budget, um, it gives us the ability to plan. And, you know, I get excited about some things that maybe others don't, uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit. We have about a $7 billion backlog of state of good repair across our roads, our port infrastructure, our airport infrastructure, our transit infrastructure. We have to keep focused on that. And, you know, it's not a big ribbon cutting type of, of an event or, or a press article, but it is really, really important because people count on that infrastructure. So trying to address these these billions of dollars in backlogs where we have to be. And this infrastructure bill is going to give us the opportunity to not only focus on that, but plan for that with some stability and some reliability. But we're also looking at the opportunities that are coming with this bill. And you know, we just finished our CTP tours and, and heard from the counties what their priorities were. Uh, and we're working to get a little bit more direction. But you know, feeding off of something that, that Secretary Valentine mentioned with Longbridge, uh, when I first came into this job, she and I had this good discussion about uh, how important Longbridge was to Maryland, but also how important the BMP tunnel, the Frederick Douglass tunnel was to Virginia and how we can coordinate as a region uh, to, to bring that together. So, you know, one of the projects I get really excited about is that Frederick Douglass tunnel, that BMP tunnel. You know, Howard Street gets a lot of attention uh, on the freight side and job growth, but we're working very closely with Amtrak, who's in the lead of this Douglas Tunnel project. We've got a record of decision in the NEPA process. It's now in design, the public outreach is underway, but it's gonna bring so many great things to this region. Uh, we're working to bring dual locomotives in, so we're gonna run electric on the Penn line and uh, diesel on the Camden line so that we can move back and forth. But the benefits of this tunnel, if, if people don't understand what it is regionally is, Replacing this tunnel is going to create the, the environment where we have safety and reliability and efficiency on our system. Seven hours of train delays per week in this tunnel, 30,000 new jobs. It's going to create an opportunity for service between Penn Station and Union Station in under 30 minutes all day and create this fully accessible and ADA compliant West Baltimore Mark Station, and it's really going to be a huge asset for the entire region and continue to bring that region together. So those are the big projects that really get excited for me about that. But that's not even in our discretionary dollars. That's in the Amtrak or the rail part of the bill that's not coming directly to the state. So it's about these partnerships and collaboration for these really game-changing regional projects uh, that we just wouldn't have the ability to address if it wasn't for this bill. I was going to ask this question later, but since you brought up the BMP tunnel, I'll, let, I'll ask it now. Can you uh, venture a guess as to when I'll be able to take a train through the new tunnel? We're starting to work on that. So uh, the Northeast Carter Commission has laid out some plans uh, working with Amtrak. The first estimate today is, you know, within the next 10 years, we'll be able to kind of go out and address that. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done on it. There's a design. The recent changes uh, allowed us to eliminate some of the ventilation shafts. So the original design and the original NEPA process had uh, ventilation shafts that had a lot of community concerns. We meet, reached an agreement with Amtrak to go to electrification in those tunnels and, and run electric locomotives through there, reducing the need for those ventilation shafts uh, and addressing some of those community concerns. So. You know, it's in that kind of 10 year, 12 year time frame uh, in today's uh, Northeast Carter plan, but uh, we're hoping to get it out there. Great. Uh, Director Lott, let's talk about dedicated bus lanes. Um, you know, I always like to say that the most cost effective way to 
address our transportation issues is to get more people to ride the bus. Uh, a good way to do that is to make the buses more efficient and, and reliable. So is there anything in the infrastructure bill that can help DDOT make bus service more reliable in the district? And, and how are you coordinating your projects with WMATA's Metro bus and DDOT circulator? Well, thanks again for that question. And similar to um, Secretary Valentine, um, the monies that we're receiving from the infrastructure project will allow us to accelerate our, our asset management programs. And so, and bus priority is right along in there with that. Um, DDoS bus priority program was established by the mayor in, in 2019. And as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, um, as we've been going through COVID, when we have fewer cars on the roadway, we really take advantage of that, uh, really to create more dedicated bus lanes uh, in the district in the anticipation that at some point we will get back to um, the new normal, or excuse me, we get back to the normal before the co before COVID was uh, here in place. Um, but our but dedicated bus lane really seeks to improve the entire rider experience. It uh, includes the, the bus stops and the accessibility, um, the bus lanes to reduce congestion delays, and also transit signal priority to address delays at the intersections. Um, our bus system is, it's a lifeline for most of our uh, most vulnerable residents. Almost half of district Metro bus riders make under $30,000 per year and two thirds live in a zero car household based on these are WMATA's data from 2018. So investing in bus infrastructure is a long term commitment um, that the district is making to improve bus on time performance and also reliability. And also our bus lanes will be in place for when riders are ready to, to take transit again. And so we're really doing everything that we can and we are coordinating and working with WMATA as we're going through that process uh, in 2020. Uh, we installed, DDOT installed three bus priority projects on our 14th Street Northwest corridor, our MLK Junior Southeast corridor, and also M Street Southeast. And this more than tripled the number of uh, dedicated bus lanes that we installed in the district. So right now we have a total of about 6.2 uh, miles of lanes of dedicated bus lanes. 16th Street Northwest is currently under construction. Um, and we're also doing a redesign of H and I Street Northwest, which is also substantially complete. So. Um, as part of our 22 budget, you know, the district is investing 51 bus priority projects across all eight wards of the district. So every ward of the district will be touched by bus priority uh, and making sure that people are afforded uh, accessible and reliable transportation. And we'll be releasing our bus priority plan later this year, uh, which will highlight the upcoming projects for advancement to our planning design. And so the following bus project, uh, the following projects are currently active in planning and design. We have Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast. We have H Street, which I just mentioned. Uh, Minnesota Avenue Southeast, um, the K Street Transit, which is a big one um, and significant one that would actually start construction at the end of 2022, and MLK, um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Avenue Southeast, which I also just mentioned. So we're really excited about bus priority. We feel that this is the way to uh, really encourage people to get out of single occupancy vehicles um, and get into something that's affordable, reliable, and, and efficient. So we are really making a true investment in our bus priority. And we really feel that once people do truly start returning back to the district and back to work, um, that they will take advantage of it and see some major improvements for, uh, for how they're traveling. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so let's talk about, you, several of you have already mentioned uh, the issue of, of inclusion um, and equity. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, you know, today we understand the importance of transportation uh, in, in unlocking doors for residents to access more opportunity, but historically many transportation projects, especially highways downtown, uh, have harmed uh, African-American neighborhoods or worsened segregation. Um, now the infrastructure bill actually includes money to try to fix some of those, uh, those harms and advocates have been talking about um, various steps uh, such as regarding I-95 in Richmond or or the highway to nowhere in Baltimore uh, and taking steps to rectify problems there. What's your what are each of your departments doing to assess transportation investments ability to enhance or hinder equity and inclusion? Secretary Valentine. Um, really, thank you for that question. I will say that um, equity, diversity, inclusion have been a priority of Governor Northam throughout this administration, and has certainly been a priority in transportation. In our long-term 
um, planning, uh, which we call VTRANS. It's run out of the Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment, run by Deputy Secretary Nick Donahue, which many of you know. You know, looking at access um, across, uh, you know, all communities in Virginia and um, really focusing at the same time on um, those communities that are underserved or distressed or disadvantaged, making sure that we're providing access to all people. So in our planning, we have been making that a priority. Um, secondly, we are in the process of uh, re, uh, restructuring our economic development incentive program. It's creating access to bring new business and really trying to look at how we can do that in distressed neighborhoods across the Commonwealth. So looking at how we can bring business there. And then um, earlier this month, um, through a study that we have put together, um, the Virginia Department of Transportation and the city of Richmond announced a study um, looking at physically reconnecting the Jackson Ward neighborhood in Richmond. It's the neighborhood that's been bisected by 95 and 64. It's about a six month study um, looking at how we can connect the North and South neighborhoods um, and really uh, uh, making a uh, theoretical possibility, a, um, a manifestation, a real project. So that's gonna be coming forward. So to me, um, Building equity into our programs is multi-pronged. Um, it's you know how we actually live our lives and how we set our priorities, and um, but very deliberately through planning, through business and commerce, um, and through these studies where we're really looking at trying to um, address the uh, the dissection of these very important African American neighborhoods. Um, is also part of our, our um, future going forward. So um, I'm really grateful that there's funding within the uh, federal package to, to connect our communities and um, we hope to take advantage of it. Secretary I should Slater. say, we plan to take advantage of it. Secretary Slater, same question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Diversity and inclusion have been a part of our core focus kind of internally and externally. So internally, we've developed a, a diversity to belonging council in order to review and look at our current policies, practices, those types of things to make sure that we're facilitating an inclusive environment throughout the department. You know, externally, uh, our, I've been working with our teams to focus on kind of bridging the divides wherever we can. And you know, I believe as an industry, we've been pretty good at address, addressing challenges within projects and programs when we have an impact. Um, but instead, maybe we need to get back to the early stages of a program or a project and think about how we can scope something uh, can be developed to create opportunity and enhance communities uh, at the beginning of a project. Uh, I'll give you a great example. As we move forward in our American Legion Bridge Uplands project, we're working extensively with historically African-American communities that were bifurcated by the original construction of the Capitol Beltway in the early 60s. Uh, we've worked on one uh, with church in particular uh, in looking at burial sites around that Morning Star Cemetery and ensuring the design of the future improvements completely avoids that property. And so in addition to that, we committed to providing the church access to the cemetery with new sidewalks and widening a shared use path formal parking lot to give them a little bit more structure and stability. And, and we're including a context sensitive treatment uh, on the noise barriers, working in consultation directly with the community. Uh, and that's just one example of the ways that we're trying to address some of these historical uh, issues. You know, you, you look at BMP tunnel, Frederick Douglass tunnel, for instance, there's language in the NEPA approval of that tunnel that's connected to using some of the tunnel material to help address the highway to nowhere situation. So there's a lot of kind of connecting pieces there. Uh, and we are looking to take advantage of a lot of those resources uh, in the infrastructure bill as well, uh, as we work to set that next foundation. Thank you. Director Lott, same question. Sure. So uh, Bob, DDOT, we've been incorporating new analysis and systems into our planning process. and. 
operational decision levels regarding racial and social inequities. Uh, we've made some longstanding programs centered on equity as well as in our office dedicated to advancing equity, uh, advancing inclusion and civil rights, and that's our um, Office of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, but in order to build upon our current work and advance our transportation equity priorities, uh, we've incorporated the following new initiatives. Um, we've developed a transportation equity statement that is at par with the department's mission and the department's vision statement. Uh, we've also created a shared transportation equity de definition that explicitly defines transportation equity as being the shared and the just distribution of benefits and burdens uh, when planning, when investing in transportation infrastructure and services across um, all areas of the district. Um, we've also uh, integrated equity priorities into our local and our federal budgeting processes and, and our resource allocation to advance equity in a very targeted and a very specific way. So for example, uh, during the FY22 budget process, um, we assessed how funding reductions and our enhancements would impact communities of color and low-income communities. Um, this tool served as a, a structured way to apply equity to our decision-making process around the resource allocation and also to formalize an approach that would help us operationalize equity within the district's um, uh, existing operations. And then we have what we call our Move DC, uh, which seeks to embed equity in the policy decisions, the policy goals, and the strategies, and the metrics by identifying transportation deficiencies that impact transit um, dependent populations such as low income, um, disabilities, seniors, youth, and zero car households. So we are continuing to make investments and continue to strive to really improve um, how we incorporate equity um, to make sure that it, we truly are providing an equitable network, a transportation network for all in the district. Thanks. So we have a few questions from the Q&A that have been submitted in the Q&A function. We don't have time for all of them, but here's one that, that I wanted to get get to from, from Patrick Wojan or Wohan. Um, the, the paraphrasing, um, you know, more and more the public conversation is recognizing the connection between transportation and land use planning. Um, you know, when jobs are not located near people's homes, people have to travel long distances, which requires more expansive highway networks, um, thus more greenhouse gas emissions. So to grow more sustainably in our region and fight climate change, you know, we need greater coordination between transportation planning and land use planning. This is often called smart growth. Everybody on this call, is, I'm sure, knows what smart growth is, transit-oriented development. So what are your departments working on to, rec to, you know, to promote a greater closer relationships and closer coordination between land use and transportation. S Secretary Valentine. I really appreciate the chance to go first because <laughs> um, I get to kind of think, thank you for that question. Um, in Virginia, all new transportation projects, all new capacity um, projects go through a system called Smart Scale. It's our prioritization process. As a part of Smart Scale, in the larger areas, the more urban areas of Virginia, land use has always been a factor. It's a very important factor for any um, project being screened and accepted and um, actually recommended. Um, just recently, at the most recent um, CTB meeting, we are recommending that land use not only be in our urban areas, but it needs to be in all regions of Virginia and all transportation districts. So making land use a priority, um, I believe is gonna help us uh, choose smarter, um, more sustainable transportation projects. So huge priority for us. Um, I will also just add, having transportation at the table as planning is um, beginning to, to um, come together. When you're bringing developers in, local officials, regional partners, having transportation there um, and not waiting until a project's been developed and then bringing in how in the world we're gonna connect it, that is really helping us as, as well. So being at the table, tying transportation decisions, to economic development and opportunity, and making sure any new project is um, factored through land use um, are ways we hope to do an even better job of addressing land use. Thank you. Secretary Slater, smart growth. 
Absolutely. Let me talk about kind of three different layers there. Uh, that's been our focus. First, transit oriented development. So we have a transit oriented development program uh, where we reach out and we put uh, proposals on the street or open solicitations on the street for private developers to come in and work with us after they get that TOD designation through uh, the various groups within the state. And then look at those solicitations and see how we can work together to incentivize the development. How can we make it an attractive site for them? How can we work uh, together to make sure that the development itself will enhance the transit system and its operability uh, around that? Because it really does all start with land use. You know, we've got a couple on the street today, but we're excited about a few as well. You know, I went down and met with um, the, uh, the president of Bowie State and talked about transit-oriented development in that region. Uh, we, we have a couple coming around in the Baltimore region, but really trying to put some renewed energy in our transit-oriented development program. The second thing I'll talk about is uh, something that uh, we started when I was over at State Highway, which is our context guide. So, you know, in a context guide, instead of having just two sets of tools to develop your project along a, the roadway system, we needed more than just urban and rural. So what the context guide does is lays out uh, the ability to use different tool sets that are more appropriate for the roadway itself. So for instance, an urban town center has an urban town center set of tools and does it, and you end up with uh, looking at the land use first and the community first, and then using your those tools to develop your projects in that. Uh, and then of course the electrification side. So we know that the future of motor vehicle travel is gonna be electric. So we need to focus on the infrastructure piece for that. We need to focus on the workforce piece for that. Uh, and that's what we're doing today to create an, an environment and a system where people can go out and they can buy an electric car and get, they can feel confident that the charging infrastructure is out there. Uh, the workforce is out there to be able to help them when they need to help them and work on these vehicles and those types of things. We're doing the same thing with our bus network and trying to convert 50% of our bus network to electric between now and 2030 and, and just really trying to focus there. So uh, it's about electrification. It's about having the right context and the right tools for the right community and incentivizing transit oriented development throughout our system. Thank you. Director Lott, Smart Growth. Yeah, so Bob, thanks again. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, bus priority has really been our focus here in the district um, since we started uh, in COVID a couple years ago. And, and bus priority is our way of still moving um, transportation equity and transportation forward and making sure we're doing it in a way that's responsible, both socially um, and environmentally. And so we've uh, really instituted, as I referenced earlier, about 6.2 miles of uh, lane miles of, of dedicated bus lanes here in Washington, D.C., with the expectation and the plans to do um, a lot more of that. But in addition, um, as um, I had referenced a little bit earlier about our bicycle infrastructure, we really are making a, a large investment in our protected bike lanes um, and our bicycle infrastructure just as a whole, uh, recognizing there, there's a, a large group of people that live in the district and some that live outside of the, the, uh, Washington, D.C. and Virginia and in Maryland that would like to take advantage of of being able to bike into the city. And so between our trail network, which is really an expansive trail network that is becoming more of a regional network um, and a connected network, we're providing that particular opportunity so that individuals who choose to, to walk, choose to scoot or choose to bike um, have um, dedicated resources, in this case, protected bike lanes are the our, uh, trail network that will allow them to be able to do so. Um, and also we have, and the mayor has really made an investment and commitment to um, a capital bike share. We recognize that right here in DC alone, there still are a couple areas where we have pockets of what we call transportation deserts, where we don't really have good, reliable, and affordable transportation options in some of those um, nooks. And so um, we're making those changes now with um, a lot of the investments that we're putting in. But in addition, we're also uh, investing more of our capital bike share options throughout all eight wards of the district. So essentially, um, you can walk out of your home. Uh, and within a quarter mile of, of your home, you'll have access to a capital bike share, which is probably the most affordable way of traveling in the district. Um, but also you'll have access to our bus priority program. Um, and then we're also are doing some expansion of our streetcar program um, that we're going to be starting uh, in the upcoming year. So these are just a couple of different ways of really trying to be more responsible, more conscious and more environmentally friendly. And we really feel like, you know, as we start seeing people come back into the district and come back to working, um, that they will be taking full advantage of these options. 
Okay, well, our time is up. I like to meet the deadlines um, when I can. Again, thank you, Secretary Valentine, Secretary Slater, and Director Lott. It is certainly an exciting time to be in transportation, and I will hand it back to uh, Jack McDougall and J.B. Holston. Great, thanks, Bob. Thanks, uh, and thanks for joining us to moderate. And uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Valentine and Secretary Slater and Director Lott. Always a lot to do, we never run out of projects. Uh, it's great to have some money behind some of those projects, which we've waited a long time for, uh, which, is, which is good, uh, and continue to look forward to working with all of you uh, to, to get some of these things done. Uh, also again, JB, thanks uh, to you and your team uh, for, for working with us on this. We, we enjoy working with you. Uh, thanks everybody in the audience uh, for joining us today. And uh, again, thanks to our sponsors for helping to make this uh, possible. Uh, with that, JB. Yeah, th thanks everybody. And thanks very much, Jack. Uh, my thanks to everyone as well. Uh, but in particular, thanks to all the panelists for your service. And in particular, particular, thank you to Secretary Valentine for uh, for your service. Uh, it's been terrific. Uh, you'll be missed. Uh, but uh, but I know you won't be far. And I know we will all rely on your counsel and advice uh, as the region moves forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying it. Wow, what a great partnership we've all had. So um, anyway, I will look forward at some point being able to celebrate and thank you. Here, here, in person to the next one. Jack, thanks again. Happy holidays to everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone.